Yes, I am recording. Hey, sleepy friends. Um, Damien here. Uh, this time it's a haul, I guess. Uh, it's kind of a long-term haul. It's kind of some cool books I've gotten in the past two months, I think. Um, I've kind of upped my spending on uh, in-stock trades. And if, if you follow me on Twitter, um, I think it's at sleepyreader666. Maybe I'll put my Twitter handle below. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you probably see the things I order from um, in stock trades, and this isn't all of them. This is the the bigger books at the moment um, that I've gotten recently, and um, the bigger volumes, um, not big books like key books or anything like that. But um, yeah, you might consider following me on Twitter because I just talk about comics on Twitter. I occasionally retweet something about the environment or some other thing like that, but uh, all my own tweets are just about comics, what I'm reading, I, you know, if I'm at lunch at work, um, like at a, a cafe or restaurant near work, I'll actually tweet out pictures of what I'm reading and give little quick reactions to them. Because a lot of my comic book reading I do on my lunch breaks at work two or three times a week. Um, because I often am exhausted by the end of the day and just go to sleep these days rather than read a lot of comics at bedtime. So um, this isn't in any, this is it. Well, actually this is in a, ordered by size. So uh, one thing I got, I was very into the um, 80th anniversary, the 1000th issue of Action Comics. I have a soft spot in my heart for Superman, even though Maybe it's not the most exciting read always uh, in the comic book world, but there's something pure about Superman that at times I really love. And um, so this is this is the dusk jacket of it with what I think of as a really bad Jim Lee illustration. But uh, I love I love what it looks like under the dusk jacket with all these old issues. I guess issues they felt were were key or meant something to the. Um, the history of Superman, um, and these images repeat throughout the book. They do not have one that I would have thought was key, which is the Neil Adams Superman uh, Kryptonite No More cover. But anyway, it's a really nice, nicely put together volume. A great sampling of Superman uh, or action comics throughout the ages. It does have a little bit that is not Superman. Uh, let's see, and it has a bunch of different introductions, Jules Pfeiffer, Paul Levitz, uh, the daughter of uh, Jerry Siegel, and of course it has the first appearances of Superman, but it also has like the first appearance of Zatara the Magician, and father of Zatanna, so that connection continues through. It even has the ash cans. They did ash cans way back then, which were, they just had cover, dummy covers and blank pages in them, I think, to send to uh, wholesalers and retailers, I guess, to give them a sense of what was coming. And uh, anyway, it's it's an awesome volume. I I really appreciate it. I don't think it was too expensive. I guess, you know, for, for it's a hardback, but for a hardback, it wasn't too bad. Let's see. Well, it was 30 bucks, but, you know, you can get it discounted online. We got the Vigilante. Isn't he still around just a little bit? I remember him in the cartoons. Um, so each section has a has a uh, introduction to it. So we get different periods of, of Superman. And it goes on up through the decades. Which um, I was surprised there wasn't even even more. Um, uh, or what's his name? Dang it! The guy who drew all those, Kurt Swan. I was surprised there wasn't even more Kurt Swan, but they they put in a Gil Kane story or two, which was a good choice. I can't remember if it's a two part story for Gil Kane or one part. Um, to me, the shame, I, I, Gil Kane is one of the few people I prefer when he's inked by someone else. <laughs> and I know he hated his inkers. And it's not like I, I hate the stuff inked by him, but 
Um, he was inking with these felt tip markers. We get uh, one John Byrne. Lois Lane, learning who Clark Kent is at last. It was so hard to figure out. So, and then at the very end, it's weird because people who read, uh, here's something else. People who read um, Superman Action Comics 1000 digitally got this Neil Adams, uh, Paul Levitt story in it. But for those of us in the physical world, we have to get it in this hardback book, which is, that's something odd happened there. I wonder if that was just a mistake. They changed their minds at the last minute and forgot to switch it out of the digital. Um, you know, Neil Adams' art is pretty good here. It's, I, I don't know what version of Lex Luthor this is. Um, Lex Luthor must be one of the characters uh, who's changed massively over the years, while Superman's kind of stayed the same for the most part. I mean, he's changed a bit. But, um, and then we get another look at the different ages of the comic, showing the same, I believe, the same covers that are highlighted on, on here. So that's a really cool volume. If you're interested in that kind of history of superhero comics, I think it's a, it's a fun memento of this fact that this superhero has lasted so long and you know he's not as popular as he used to be but still he's got a healthy career <clears throat> okay next my next biggest book is this is the most recent one i got actually it's called we spoke out comic books in the holocaust and it's edited by neil adams this fellow named Raphael Medoff, who I think is an expert on the Holocaust, and Craig Yo, who's an anthologist who um, usually does antho theme anthologies using out-of-copyright material. This, I think, is all in-copyright material, and I believe it was uh, donated, the use of it was donated by the um, comic book companies. And so they all are appearing together. It begins with this famous... EC story, The Master Race, drawn by, um, what's his name, Krigstein. It's a, it's a thing that I've seen sort of images from it quoted before in other comics history articles and, and uh, books. This is a very, this volume feels very nice to the hand. They've done something to the paper so it's just faintly aged looking although it's very slick paper. And as you can see, it's pretty oversized. Here's a, a regular comic book. So the idea, I mentioned the Holocaust. The idea is that these are comic strips from the Holocaust, or about the Hol dealing with the Holocaust in one way or another. And for a long time, like in public education and the like, um, the whole, sorry, I'm multitasking here. The Holocaust was not dealt with much in education. Often kids did not know much about the Holocaust. The idea here is they often learned about the Holocaust through comic books uh, rather than in their history classes in junior high school and such. Um, I could understand that the Holocaust is a very hard subject to deal with and to explain it and to deal with the scope of it and the brutalness of it and how it could happen at all. Um, is beyond most of us to talk about. It's great, this is where fiction and art sort of can take over because it's so hard to just envelop the history of it. Here's another uh, beautiful EC Holocaust story. But then what surprised me, we got various things. What's this one? I don't know what, they don't show a cover. Um, so starting in the 50s, you might as a kid learn about the Holocaust in comics and in the 60s you might learn about it from creepy comics is that uncle creepy or uncle eerie i think that's uncle creepy and this one interestingly i never even knew gene colin drew for creepy comics um, it's great to see gene colin in black and white so i appreciate that and then what i was trying to say was i was surprised that the bulk of this is actually marvel and dc comics 
And you won't normally see those two reprinted together under the same covers, but um, for this cause they are. So we got a, uh, Captain Marvel. We got a Batman drawn by Neil Adams. We have... Um, and how I learned about I did not know about this or didn't know what this really was when I saw the title until I listened to a podcast that interviewed the three editors of this, and they were all very passionate about it, including Neil Adams. Um, and, uh, you know, at times I've complained about Neil Adams because of his ego, but he is a sharp man in many ways, and I, I really appreciate him, I have to say. And since that time I talked to him at briefly at I Love Like Comic Con, uh, you know, I had kind of was nervous about talking to him because I'd heard some negative things, but actually I thought he was quite nice and he would probably have been willing to talk to me longer than he actually did because I scurried away. So for DC, had all these great war comics, so it's an obvious place to deal with the Holocaust, although a pretty rough place. Marvel 2 in War as Hell had a thing. I, I have not read most of these yet. I've read a lot of the introductions and essays in the middle, and they're very good and very powerful and give you a nice context. So the losers um, deal with the Holocaust, and somewhere in here is a really... I didn't even know DC had a comic book called Blitzkrieg. That's a pretty powerful emotional cover there by Joe Kubert, a Jewish man. And um, this is it. yeah, I'm not quite sure what this is from. This is just a double page spread about the Holocaust. And for what I presume to be a 1970s comic, that's pretty graphic. Um, so yeah. I'm impressed that that DC and the others dealt with this so often. But especially DC, I think, dealt with it a lot. Captain America. I would imagine this is not the only Captain America to deal with the Holocaust, but maybe it's the best one. Um, it's written by Chris Claremont and Roger McKenzie, which I thought was interesting, too. I did not know that, although it's kind of natural. Chris Claremont's de dealt with the Holocaust in the X-Men. In fact, there is a Chris Claremont X-Men in here, too. Oh, yeah, here's another Captain America. <clears throat> so anyway, it's an, it's an excellent volume. Yeah, there's the, um, the X-Men one. I think it's a... Um, <clears throat> I think it's drawn by, by um, Cro Cockrum. And then there's this interesting one. I'd like. I think I'll read this next um, about an artist who was sent to the concentration camps. And I guess this was written by Raphael Medoff and drawn by Neil Adams. And it, it appeared in some kind of Marvel comic. And so um, her apparently her family is still trying to get her art back. So interesting stuff. Um, so if you're all interested in this kind of history and its connection to comics, I think this is a, a great, great volume and really well done. It was not cheap. <clears throat> also not cheap, but uh, I got, in fact, they're the same price. That was 50 bucks and this is 50 bucks. This collects the Sky Masters of the Space Force comic strip done by Jack Kirby, Dick and Dave Wood, and Wallace Wood and Dick Ayers. So I need, I need to look into this more. I've just paged through it. I think what happened is um, Dick and Dave Wood were the writers, Kirby was the penciler, and Wally Wood was the inker. And I find Wally Wood inking Jack Kirby to be a, a fascinating sight. They're both masters in very different ways of science fiction, so for them to be doing a science fiction series together is really cool. Um, this is a very nice volume, but uh, I feel like I read something here about it, it being out of copyright also. 
I hope that's not true. I hope the heirs of of Wood and Kirby are, or of the Woods, are getting um, getting some money out of this. But anyway, um, I don't. Hermes Press. What made me think that? I can't find it quickly. But anyway. Um, So this is from 1958. You know, what would have happened if this comic strip had taken off and then the Marvel Age of Comics never happened because Jack Kirby was too busy? Or would Stan Lee have found other artists? I mean, he did have Steve Ditko, who he could have ably um, worked with. Of course, life is always full of what-ifs, huh? <clears throat> we'll never know. Okay, let's see. Which one is bigger? This one or that one? Since I'm going by size. Now they're about the same. So I'll go next with this Steve Rude collectible um, sleeved uh, book about his art called Steve Rude Artist in Motion, published by Flesk and co-authored by John Fleskies. So I assume it's a very small press and John Fleskies must have loved Steve Rude. And someone on Twitter alerted me to a sale of, apparently this has some slight flaw in it. So I got it for $10 instead of $60. And it includes a um, one of those pages that they kind of just stick in after the fact. It's like an art, an extra art print with that is numbered. This is number one hundred two of a thousand. I don't know if, given there were flaws on it, if they published more to bring the thousand back up to a thousand. I have not been able to find the flaw unless I thought I saw a slight ripple somewhere on here, but now I can't find it. Or maybe is it this slight spot? Did that? I just assume that came from. No, that came from my daughter probably. So, um, so this is a lot of process work and paintings and everything from Steve Rude. It's similar to getting one of his sketchbooks, only it's hardback and there's a lot more stuff. And there's, and there's some text that you can read about what's going on. It's a beautiful volume. Um, I think it's just a black cover on the inside. Yeah. It's quite sturdy back cover. It doesn't feel like the cheap hardback, uh, cardboard or anything that some car, hardbacks come in. And there's nice end papers. The end paper's the same on both ends. Yeah. So anyway, um... You might go to flesk.com and see if they're still selling these these ones um, slightly these slightly imperfect versions still. I don't know if they are. Um, I bought this a while ago, maybe half a maybe a month ago. I don't know. He also does his life drawing. You know, as a just look. He seems so dynamic and exciting when he's doing comic book work, and he just seems like kind of a standard guy when it comes to life drawing. It's kind of odd. I know that at one point he wanted to switch over purely to kind of the life drawing fine art world and didn't make it. I don't think, I think his style was probably way too old fashioned for what goes on in galleries these days. Um, although I might be wrong. Maybe he did have a chance, or maybe he still will make it in that world. He's, in my opinion, you know, well, you've heard me say it many times before, just one of the best, one of the, the best of the last 30 years. Um, in the, in the, like, he came in later than the Silver Age artists, but he, he uh, matches a lot of them, in my opinion. So anyway, um, there's that. I better keep moving along here. Bigger things to come. Kind of the same size is this oddity. X-Men Grand Design. I guess it came out in a normal size comic book. A thicker comic book. So this is just the first two issues put into a giant size volume. It's this um, 
indie underground artist Ed Pisker retelling the whole history of the X-Men. Um, his art style, for want of a better description, f feels somewhat akin to, um, you know, 1970s, 19, early 70s, late 60s underground artists to me. Maybe if I were, were hipper and knew what was going on in the current scene. I guess he had a, a big indie hit with something about the history of hip-hop. I did not read that. And the tr truth to be told, I I've already read this. And um, Matt and I are going to be doing a podcast on this one. So I will hold on. I'll just say I'm not sure how I feel about it. I, I kind of found it fascinating to read. I wasn't able to fit all the history together with what I know about the X-Men. And I'm really excited to see what Matt will say about it. <clears throat> in the back, he recolored in his own style the... Um, the first Jack Kirby's first issue of the X-Men back from 1963 or 62 or whatever it was. He, he purposefully makes all the paper look yellowed and the colors have kind of a faded quality. So they're pretty old fashioned comic booky, except all muted. Um, I wasn't super excited by this recoloring, but whatever, I guess there's more, there's a little more detail to his own coloring, um, in his own work, maybe. So an interesting oddity. It's a really it's was very expensive. It was it was thirty bucks, and it's paperback, but it's like with this vinyl stuff. It's very thick and heavy, and of course it's replicating that feel of the old Marvel treasuries. Now this giant baby here's a regular size comic book, a uh, poster book for the 75th anniversary of DC Comics. So I assume that was five years ago. I was not aware of this coming out. I just stumbled across it at a used bookstore. Got it for $20 and it's a $40 price tag. I don't know if it's still in print or not. So, and it makes me very happy because it utilizes the full page to show these, these classic DC covers rather than, um, you know, how some of these coffee table books will have a lot of small reproductions. So on, on the left side, every page is, is a full poster. You, I think there's even perforations that you could rip them out and hang them on your wall. Is there? Yeah, there is. So I love this. I, I love big. I love seeing the covers nice and big like this. There should be, I wish there was many more books like this. And it, it goes through the entire 75 year history of DC. What's the very last cover they show, I wonder? Who's that? Uh, is that Gary? F no. Oh, it's an Alex, they end with an Alex Ross Batman cover. And what do they begin with? I assume Action Comics number one, yeah. Action Comics number one. Great book. Um, I think I, if I had found it for $40, I probably would have paid the $40. But I'm happy to get this um, undamaged used copy for, for 20 Oh my, what a big book. But... A week or two ago, I got a box in the mail. It was huge, and I pulled out, and when I pulled it out, I got this box. There's a comic book next to it. I was so excited. The king-size Kirby. A uh, $200 book. Got it for 100 Or maybe a little less. I, got a, I, I had such an amazing discount going from several discounts piled up on In Stock Trades. I decided now was the moment to get this book. Even though I had just mentioned to um, Earl Grey that I probably wouldn't get it because I have most of these comics already. Um, so I was super excited. I opened up the box and it's got the actual, it's got two placeholders here because the book inside is not as big as this box. So I got super excited at how huge this was, and then I pulled it out, and it was huge, but it was smaller. Um, there's the actual, 
It's in a slip case. Um, same, well, it is so heavy. So let me see if I can do a comparison. So I thought it was going to be this size, <laughs> and it turned out to be that size. So I went from there to there in my expectations. What did I lose? About three and a half, four inches. And then that's, it's in a slip case. So that's the size of the slip case. You slide the book out. Hopefully I don't break anything in the process. And it's got this cool, super blown up panel from, I think a set must be a seventies Kirby drawing of Captain America. Ugh, heavy, but it's now even smaller compared to the bookcase, the slip case. I've lost another half an inch or so, or three quarters of an inch. Not really a big deal, but it's fun as I go down from the, uh, from the original box. You know, reduced expectations. Things are getting smaller on me. Still, it's probably the biggest book in my collection, except for those IDW artists editions. Um, let's see. I need a Sherpa to help me with this. There's there's a regular size comic book next to it. But in a weird way, they've shrunk it down a little further because they made this odd design choice of centering everything or or making these the edges of the pages this this Kirby crackle design and I knew that was coming because I saw it on um, Earl Gray's video so uh, let's see if I can pull this up Earl Gray filmed this much better I, I have you go over to his channel and look for his um, his look through of this book because I don't I don't even know how to set up my camera to look at these giant books <clears throat> I don't have time right now to do anything but this. So it starts with um, was it the Red Raven, I think. No, with um, with Mercury from Red Raven Comics. That I guess is a Jack Kirby cover, and I don't. I assume that Mercury was Kirby's first Marvel story. Um, Shades of many characters he was he would later work on, I think. Let's see how am I doing on time? Because I gotta go pick up my daughter soon. Look at my phone. I got I got a few more minutes. So maybe I should well, I don't know. So we get a lot of stuff. <laughs> but as I thumbed through it, there was stuff I wished was in it. Um more, I wanted even more Fantastic Four. I wanted even more Thor, I think. No, there's a good amount of Thor in here, I think. Um, you know what I, I wanted? I think they represent his um, return to Marvel. Let's see if I can lift this up. Uh, they represent, that's a, I just like that page as so I flip past it. They represent his return to Marvel with um, Captain America Bicentennial Story. Oh, look at that baby. Oh yeah. And um, so the Captain America Bicentennial Story and then the, um, the first issue of the Elemental, not the Elementals, the Eternals. Um, but I don't know. I want. I you know what? I felt like there should be a cover gallery in here, of more covers, and one of the cool things he did when he came. Oh, and they've got Devil Dinosaur. One of the cool things he did when he came back to Marvel is he did a lot of covers for them. So clearly his covers were helping sell comic books that he was not drawing, because um, his covers were all over the place. I remember back then, and I see when I when I look through old comics. Um, oh, and finally we got get the often reprinted um, what if that he drew late in his career. You know, what if the Marvel bullpen became the Fantastic Four? Which is an okay story. 
I, I seem to remember there was something he wanted to, to do with this story that they wouldn't let him do. I can't remember right at this moment what that was. Oh, and then, like, the cover gallery as such is these sort of digitally repainted covers of his that they've used on some collections. And those are of much lesser interest to me than real covers by Kirby. Um, so, yeah, uh, big, big books. And that's one of the things I've been up to lately. Um, I hope to be back soon with another video. Talk to you all later. Figure out how